Boa tarde. Meu nome é James Green, sou o diretor executivo da Brasa. O Neil Safier, que é o diretor da John Carter Brown Library, onde nós é, realizamos um dos dois, duas recepções ontem à noite, me pediu avisar se alguém não conseguiu... É, é, alô? Se alguém não conseguiu, agora, né? É, assistir, ver a exposição no John Carter Brown Library, está aberto até às 5 da tarde. Nós vamos terminar aqui às 4 e meia no máximo, então dá para dar um pulinho para dar a exposição, porque amanhã a biblioteca está fechado. Bom, é, além de ser diretor da Brasa, eu sou é, é, professor da História e Cultura Brasileira na Brown University, e eu queria primeiro chamar a, as pessoas que vão compor a mesa hoje à tarde sobre o futuro dos estudos brasileiros. Primeiro, Marshall Eakin, da Vanderbilt University. É, depois, Tiana Marshall, da University of California, Berkeley. E depois, a Pedro Monteiro, da Princeton University. Uma década atrás, a Brasa realizou um simpósio uh, sobre o futuro de estudos brasileiros nos Estados Unidos, aqui em Brown University. O objetivo do evento foi de começar a pensar estrategicamente sobre como poderíamos fortalecer e expandir os estudos sobre o Brasil nos Estados Unidos. Marshall Eakin preparou é, o relatório final é, com uma série de propostas baseadas nas discussões do simpósio. Podemos dizer que houve muitos avanços nos últimos dez anos, tanto na expansão de programas da língua portuguesa, quanto ao interesse no Brasil nos Estados Unidos, em parte promovido pelo crescimento econômico na primeira década do século XX, um, e em parte pela divulgação de ideias sobre o BRIC, Brasil, Rússia, Índia e China, combinado com uma nova versão ufanista de um Brasil grande ou um Brasil emergente. Ao longo dos últimos dez anos, a Brasa também se consolidou, como foi mencionado ontem à noite, com o um comitê executivo que funciona e é deliberativa, com uma situação financeira estável e com um reconhecimento internacional. E o fato que já realizamos 13 congressos internacionais é um exemplo, eu acho, dos nossos uh, sucessos nesses, uh, nesses últimos 20 anos da nossa existência. Hoje temos a oportunidade de voltar a este debate de 10 anos atrás com três pessoas de três disciplinas em três momentos na sua carreira acadêmica. Então, eu vou introduzir cada um... É, a pessoa vai falar, depois vou entrar a outra pessoa. Vamos, é, cada um vai falar 20 minutos, depois vamos abrir para um debate onde as pessoas podem participar, como fizemos 10 anos atrás aqui. Tem dois microfones para fazer isso. O Brian McCann, que é o vice-presidente da Brasa, está tomando notas para a gente é, registrar essa atividade e depois é, planejar um plano estratégico é, para a, a, a apresentar no Comitê Executivo da Brasa e, eventualmente, elaborar um, um plano estratégico sobre o futuro de estudos brasileiros nos Estados Unidos e a participação da Brasa nessa essa esforça. Depois, às quatro horas, a gente vai terminar essa reunião e Tony Pereira, presidente da Brasa, vai é, é, presidiar uma Assembleia Geral da Brasa, porque tem uma moção, várias moções, sobre a situação atual e ele vai é, é, trabalhar é, sobre esse assunto. Então, nós vamos tentar de terminar as quatro horas. E eu acho que as, as próximas sessões começam às 4 45 então, se terminamos a Assembleia Geral às 4 h dá para as pessoas assistirem o, as sessões a partir de é, 4 45 Bom, é, para mim é uma grande honra é, a apresentar Marshall Eakin, que é professor titular de História da América Latina, com especialização em Brasil, da Vanderbilt University. A, além de ser um grande acadêmico, uma pessoa muito importante no desenvolvimento dos estudos brasileiros na área de História, o Marshall foi diretor executivo da Brasa durante seis anos. Foi seis anos? Sete anos. Gente, merece mais ainda o aplauso. É, para, é, é, e, 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 e ajudou a transição entre o núcleo inicial do John Thomas, onde ele fundou e segurou a associação nos últimos, nos primeiros anos, e o Marshall uh, manteve e expandiu e fortaleceu a organização 
com seu mandato com o uh, diretor executivo. Então, é uma pessoa chave e muito importante, uh, junto com to John Tolman e outras pessoas na história, na preservação da nossa organização. Marshall é o autor de vários livros, entre eles British Enterprise in Brazil, The St. John's Array Mining Company and the Moro Velho Gold Mine, 1830-1960, Tropical Capitalism, The Industrialization of Belo Horizonte and, um, and uh, Brazil, The Once and Future Country, entre outras publicações. Como mencionei, já foi diretor da Brazilian Studies Association durante sete anos e ajuda muito na consolidação da organização. Marshall. Vou falar em inglês, está funcionando. Vocês podem ouvir. Vou falar em inglês, mas depois, se vocês quiserem, posso responder em português as perguntas. All right, I'm the historian of the group. I'm at a certain point in my career. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a sort of the longer view and where I think we're going. If you look at, a lot of this comes out of one of the publications uh, about 10 years ago was a look at O Brasil dos Brasilianistas is what it came out in Portuguese, looking at Brazilian studies in the United States since the 1940s. This was all fields. Uh, so a lot of the people in this room from different disciplines educated me on this. If you look at Brazilian studies, the closest thing to Brazilian studies in the United States in the early 20th century were there were some people teaching Portuguese and a few historians, very few, a handful. In the 30s and 40s, you start to see a few more people teaching history and Portuguese. And then by the time you get to the 50s and 60s, you start to see people in something you could call political science in the modern sense, sociology. And then there's this continuity across almost the entire 20th century of people doing anthropology, right. in particular in the northeast of Brazil and the Amazon. So this is a sort of group of Brazilianists in the United States by about 1960. My estimate is you may be talking about 200 people at any given moment, say in the late 50s. Then there's the great boom of the 1960s in Latin American studies in the United States, the Cuban Revolution, Title VI. You get the formation of NDEA Title VI centers, which are now national resource centers. So this huge boom takes place in the first generation of Brazilianists, right? The generation that everybody knows and names as Brazilianistas is really these people who are trained in the 1960s. In my field, people like Tom Skidmore and Joe Love, right? Reardon Rowett, Werner Baer, who just died, right? These people are emerged in the 1960s, and these are the people who trained me. Right? When I went to graduate school in the second half of the 1970s, this was this huge group of people that had suddenly taken shape. They also, from my point of view, had an enormous impact on Brazilian studies and their fields in Brazil, far more than anybody, any of us will now or in the future. Part of this is if you look at Brazil, Brazil's academic community was tiny in the early 1960s. So as Brazil's academic community booms post-1970, the number of Brazilian academics right, who are writing about Brazil becomes enormous. But the number of Brazilianists in the United States has remained relatively stable. Right? We tried to do an estimate of Brazilianistas in the United States, which raises a difficult question, what's a Brazilianista? Right? But if you take the sort of traditional definition of people who are in humanities, social sciences, people who speak Portuguese, who engage in research in Brazil and publish about Brazil. After doing many, many attempts at census, probably around 500 people, that's it, 500 people in the United States would fit that category. Right. So by the 19, I guess by about 1980, that number is probably about that level. And it has remained relatively stable if you use that kind of definition over the last generation or two. So the number of Brazilianists in that sense has been relatively stable for probably a generation or two, while the number of Brazilians in academia, in Brazil, studying Brazil, keeps going up. Which is one of the reasons why the impact of Brazilianists, no matter how good their work is, is always going to be smaller. So this expansion takes place. The real shift, this is what's left of me as a historian of technology. The real shifts are technological here. When Leslie Bethel first went to Brazil in the early 1960s, he got on a ship. All right. In steerage, as a matter of fact. Right? By the time I go to Brazil in the late 1970s, I took Pan American Airways. Right? And it was a long, slow trip, and it was really expensive. Right? What happens is you get a transportation revolution, and it becomes much easier in the 1980s and 1990s for us to go back and forth. Right? So you start to see greater and greater exchange of people moving back and forth, and then this enormous expansion post-1995 or so 
of the internet, of telecommunications. We can all just get on FaceTime or Skype and talk to each other now. Right? So what this has done is it's intensified the contact between people in Brazil and outside of Brazil, study in Brazil, and this is a real shift. Uh, but I would say in numbers of people in the United States, in those traditional fields studying in Brazil, has remained relatively stable. Part of this has to do with the nature of American academia. It shifts within the American Academy. But our, here's the pessimistic side. What has funded Portuguese in particular and kept it alive is Title VI. Right? Foreign Language Area Studies Fellowships, right? I spent my second year in graduate school on what was then called an NDEA Title VI Foreign Language Fellowship, right? That's what got me to study Portuguese. Right? And if those of you who teach Portuguese, you know this well, by and large, we don't get people who walk into the class with no language background and start studying Portuguese. We steal from those who are Spanish speakers already. So that money, it made it possible for Portuguese to exist, to survive, and to continue to survive in the American Academy. Right? This is what's made it possible for area study centers to thrive. And they must have a Brazilian component, as we heard Brazilian say, because it's not Latin America if you don't have Brazil in there. Right. So part of what has kept Brazilian studies, and especially Portuguese, surviving over those decades is federal funding, which is every time we come around a new cycle is threatened. Someday that funding is not going to be there anymore. Um, the other funding has come from institutions. So if you have visionary places like Brown, or let me pat myself on the back, Vanderbilt, right? They will fund Brazilian studies. For whatever reason, they will do it. But there are very few institutions willing to make that kind of commitment. And that commitment can come and go depending on who the leadership is at those institutions. So the challenge for us, and one of the challenges that's central to that set of recommendations 10 years ago is fundraising. Right. And that doesn't mean going to the US government. It means turning to the private sector the way American University has done for everything else. It's convincing the people at your university, whether it's Berkeley, Texas, UCLA, whatever, and persuading them to make Brazilian studies a priority. Because then what you do is you raise endowments, which are permanent, which provides you with regular income, and gives you stability in your organization. So this is something I can't overemphasize. We pointed this out 10 years ago. It's still the most pressing need. That money, ironically enough, is most likely to come from corporations who do business in Brazil, right? American corporations, and from Brazilian multinationals, some of whom are having a few problems at the moment. Right? That's where the money's gonna come from. And if you look around at Latin American studies in general across the United States, those centers which now have the greatest stability are the places that are now endowed. Harvard, Texas, prime examples. Now the University of Illinois, but not their Latin American studies program, their Brazilian studies program, right? Tulane, right? So for us in Latin American studies and specifically in Brazilian studies, in the future, the way we're going to survive, much less thrive, has got to be fundraising and the creation of endowments. Um, if you look around, what's been created, our recommendations in that report 10 years ago, one of the recommendations was to create new chairs in Brazilian studies, in whatever field, to create new programs. The ones that have been created have all been created out of money from the private sector. And if you look at who's done the most on this, Jorge Paulo Lehman has been the greatest contributor so far over the last decade to Brazilian studies. But again, speaking from a place that's not what I call on the perimeter of the US, there are tendency in the Brazilian embassy, Brazilian foreign service, Brazilian corporations, is to favor the traditional places, Boston, New York, Washington. Maybe we'll go to the Bay Area in San Francisco. Right? So the tendency has been to concentrate those resources, what I would call the perimeter. The real shift, in Brazilian studies, as I see it, that's already taken place and is going to continue, is outside what we traditionally call Brazilian studies, outside the humanities, social sciences. It's, going to, it's already started taking place in what are usually called STEM disciplines. Right. More and more people who are doing work in Brazil, however short or long term, right, who are doing serious, sustained research with Brazilians are in those STEM disciplines. These are people in everything from forestry to ecology to wildlife management, HIV AIDS and TB work, public health, mathematics, big data sets, right? These are people who have large amounts of money, right? Who are well-funded 
and are in some ways not really Brazilianist, they're global. Right? They do research connections to people all over the globe, which generally means we can't expect to go to the guys I work with in the medical school and say, you really got to learn Portuguese. <laughs> I have people, I'll give you two examples of this. In my university, which has great Brazilian studies, the major project that I'm working on now involves people in the medical school who are working on HIV, AIDS, and TB, right? and people in political science who are doing a Latin American public opinion project, sophisticated polling. I have no expertise in either of those. But my objective is to get these people together. It gets my opportunities for my students and for my institution to do more stuff in Brazil. Right? The physicians I'm working with go to Brazil far more than I do and rarely stay for more than two days. They don't speak Portuguese, but they have a huge network of Brazilian collaborators. Collaborators I never would have met had I not worked with these guys in the medical school. Right. This, they have access to very large grants, which then allow my students to go to Brazil, whether they're interested in medicine or not, do research, learn to speak Portuguese, and become Brazilians. Right. So I say these kinds of projects are part of the future of Brazilian studies in the United States. So it means that people who teach Portuguese are going to remain really, really important. But increasingly, they are going to be training people who are not in the traditional fields that go into history, political science, anthropology, take your pick. So that's a crucial thing. So I think my prediction here is that that core of people who are Brazilianistas, which has remained relatively stable for several decades now, will continue to remain relatively stable with the proviso that the job market is so bad <laughs> in some fields in academia. My own field is reasonable compared to the students who are trying to get a job in 20th century U.S. history or European history, right? But they, so that's going to face still pre pressure to, to, to narrow the field. So that core is going to remain stable, but if Brazilian studies, strangely enough, is going to grow in the next decades, it's going to grow because of its connections outside of those traditional fields. It's going to be people in law, people in education, people in the sciences, people in medicine, people in public health, right? That's where it's going to grow. And so for us who are, really are the hardcore Brazilianistas, right? <laughs> our objective is to use that as much as possible to create more Brazilianistas and also conscientizar all these guys who are in the other fields. So the future, I say, is, is holding on to that core of people in traditional Brazilian studies and building on those links with people in those newer fields. Thank you. Para as pessoas que chegaram depois da abertura, é, é, vamos ter três pessoas ah, apresentando ideias sobre o futuro dos estudos brasileiros nos Estados Unidos. E depois, um debate, uma oportunidade as pessoas conversaram ah, sobre essa, essa questão. E depois, às quatro horas, a gente vai terminar essa, essa sessão e abrir uma Assembleia Geral é, sobre outras questões. Ah, agora, eu tenho a honra de apresentar a Tiana Pachel que é professora e assistente de estudos afro-americanos na Universidade de Califórnia, em Berkeley. Ela trabalha com, com o cruzamento entre ideologia racial, política e globalização na, na América Latina. Ela está preparando dois livros, um livro sobre a construção de subjetividade política negra, baseada em estudos etnográficos e trabalhos em arquivos, e também outra, ela é coeditora de uma coletânea sobre a transnacionalismo e negritude nas Américas. Tatiana. Primeiro, boa tarde a todas e todos. É, eu queria dizer que eu vou falar em inglês, lembrando do meu prime primeiro professor é, de português na PUC no Rio, há muito tempo, que me falou muitas vezes que meu português é bem da rua, então vou falar em inglês. <laughs> ok. First, um, I'd like to say it's really an honor um, to be here for many reasons, but I think um, the most important of which is that junior scholars don't typically get these kinds of opportunities, and I would like um, to ja thank um, James Green for this opportunity. And of course, this is the chicest event or venue that I've ever spoken at. So before I'd like to start, I'd like to say a little something about the place from which I'm speaking. So I come as someone relatively new to this field, though dedicated to Brazilian studies. Um, I finished my PhD just five years ago. So I'm far less equipped to talk about some of these um, 
sort of institutional changes or um, the institutional configurations that we would need to kind of sustain and grow Brazilian studies. Um, I also come from a place that's very much situated in the social sciences, and particularly the study of social movements, um, but also the study of the African diaspora. And as such, my reading of the current literature, but also the directions that I um, naturally think that we might go in as a field come from that perspective. And finally, I'd like to apologize to the historians and the historically-minded folks in the room in advance. Um, what I'm going to present today, um, in part because of the kind of conjuntura politica that Brazil is in right now, um, is, is kind of presentist. Um, that said, I'm fully aware of the ways in which kind of historians and historically-minded people can kind of help us to contextualize this current moment, to help us understand this moment, and most of all, to help us avoid um, hyperbole, which I'm prone to. So what is the future of Brazilian studies? Um, so what I, I'd like to do in this short presentation is talk a little bit about what I, what I see as um, some sort of methodological and substantive questions um, that I think will be important for charting um, the, the, the sort of future of Brazilian studies in the United States. And I'll end by saying one little thing about what I think um, the kind of institutional configurations might look like especially given the context of Brazil's current um, political and economic crisis. So there are many reasons why I think Brazilian studies moving forward should engage more in comparison, especially within Latin America. Everything from the rise of leftist governments throughout the region, the political, social, and economic consequences of the commodities boom, but then the commodities bust in the region, to the politicization of the right and their use of social movement strategies to oppose leftist governments is not unique to Brazil. So what comparison can do is to highlight not only these similarities, but also underscore some of the uniqueness of Brazil. For example, in my research, I look at the trajectory of black movements in Colombia and Brazil, and particularly the role of black movements um, in shifting public discourse, um, state institutions, and legal institutions around ethno-racial rights. And while I think it's important to study these individually, and I could have certainly done that, um, the comparison actually allowed me a kind of analytic leverage I would not have otherwise had. It was through this comparison that I was able to chart the articulation of different kinds of black political subjects within and between these countries. Um, it's also um, through this that I was able to look at these different logics of black incorporation, right? These tensions between the logic of equality and integration on the one hand and the logic of difference and autonomy on the other as well as embedded in these, these tensions between race and ethnicity and between the material realities of urban and rural black populations. But it's also through comparing black rights in Colombia and Brazil that I believe we can actually make the most convincing case against these kinds of Bordeaux and Vaucon arguments, right? That the politicization of race in Brazil is inevitably a product of US um, cultural imperialism. So in the book, I ask, why in the world would Brazil be more susceptible to US influence than a place like Colombia, right? And there are many reasons why we wouldn't expect that. But also, it's interesting to note that um, the kind of black rights that have been institutionalized in Colombia could not look more different than the United States. For a US audience, they, we would be baffled um, by what has been institutionalized there. And so this, is, um, this kind of comparison um, is really important to me, and this is why I firmly believe that spaces like Braza are absolutely imperative, just as having Brazilianists at LASA also is. And this is at LASA both on panels about Brazil, but also in integrated panels about the region as a whole. So the second methodological point I want to make is about transnationalism. While those working on rights-based movements in Brazil have long taken a transnational approach, I believe that the case could be made for the utility of this in nearly every area in Brazilian society, from youth culture to participatory governance. In my area of studying race in Brazil, there are several volumes that have um, come out in the last few years that take this transnational approach. This includes Gladys Mitchell and Elizabeth Horch Freeman's recent book that looks at transnationalism. In them, they invert the idea that such transnationalism always flows um, in an expected direction, right, from north to south. 
Um, in Brazil, Amilcar Pereira's book, Mundo Negro, shows how African-American newspapers in the 1920s and 1930s were inspired by the fact that in Brazil, they had a formidable black movement, in fact. They looked um, upon the Frenchy Negra Brasileira, um, which had support throughout the country and which was an official political party in awe, right? And a similar dynamic is happening now um, with the mobilization against the dehumanization of black people in Brazil and throughout the Americas. So I've been asked a lot over this last year by scholars and by newspapers um, to comment on, on what is often phrased as Black Lives Matter in Brazil. And I'm always really hesitant to do so because the very framing of the question presumes a particular flow, right? A flow of influence from north to south. But we know from the work of Kristen Smith that these move movements against racialized state violence in Brazil and against a disproportionate murder of black poor Brazilians by the police and by death squads predates Black Lives Matter in the United States. In fact, the contemporary black movement in Brazil began as a response to the murder of Hobison Silveira da Luz, 27-year-old black man from Sao Paulo who was falsely accused of stealing fruit at a market and who was later tortured and murdered by the police. So while groups like Campanha Reaja, which Kristen talks about in her work, have taken up this fight against what they call the exterminio of black people, um, they do this in conversation with and solidarity with Black Lives Matter in the US, but they are not produced through those movements. Beyond the question of black movements or indigenous movements in terms of their transnationalism, I think a transnational approach is more important than ever and this has to do with the way that Brazil has positioned itself as a leader in the global south. Um, it has created models of governance and ways of thinking about social inclusion that have been exported, they've been copied, they've been appropriated throughout the world. And of course, this is not new, right? We can go back and look at earlier per periods and think about this kind of transnationalism as we see in Jerry Davila's book, right? Hotel Tropico, which looks at Brazilian foreign policy um, on the African continent. So I believe that one of the places where Brazilian studies in the US might be actually well positioned um, is to actually chart these transnational processes. Doing so will necessarily trouble the idea that there is this inevitable flow from north to south, at the same time that it will uncover these other flows from south to south and from south to north. So the third provocation um, is that the future of Brazilian studies in the US must engage in something that might be called deep interdisciplinarity. I'm involved in several research projects and networks across disciplines and across this hemisphere. And we write edited volumes together, we meet regularly, we organize panels, but what we rarely do is co-produce truly interdisciplinary work. Instead, what's often the case is we have these cultivated multidisciplinary spaces where the only thing that binds these different ways of seeing, these different ways of asking, and these different ways of knowing are the opening remarks of a panel, right, or the opening um, introductory chapter, chapter of an edited volume. Yet we know that interdisciplinarity is a buzzword within our institutions in the United States. Um, and there are many incentives, at least in the institutions where I've been, to kind of do more projects across discipline. Large research collaborations, co-taught courses, the so-called big idea series. Similarly, in Brazil, at least one of the um, areas where there's more interdisciplinarity is within um, the growing field of Afro-Brazilian studies. And I should say that this field has been in the making for many years, but the institutions are um, catching up to um, these different um, nuclei of studies um, and people who have been working on this for many decades. So it's no surprise to me that the study of Afro-Brazilians is one of the key places in Brazil that's challenging disciplinary boundaries. Scholars working on race, and especially those who are themselves of African descent, have historically found ourselves in disciplines that could not hear us, in entrenched epistemological approaches that weren't flexible enough to contain the multi-dimensional experiences of African descended people, from oppression to resilience, from creolization to resistance. We have found creative ways to push the disciplinary boundaries or wherever we have um, been. And so most of us have been trained in traditional disciplines, but this is changing. 
But even the ones of us that are trained in traditional disciplines typically find our homes in African American studies just as we find them in our disciplines. And I'm thinking here of people like Michael Hanchard, Anani here at Brown, and also Kim Butler, who I think is in the room somewhere. Hey, Kim, okay. <laughs> um, so I say this all to say that I think that the future of Brazilian studies is necessarily a more interdisciplinary one, and one that could benefit from more dialogue with scholars of the African diaspora who are situated in these interdisciplinary departments. Beyond talking to each other, this kind of deep interdisciplinarianism would require more concerted efforts to actually construct knowledge together. And in this, I think Braza is actually ahead of the game and it has an incredibly important role to play. Ultimately though, my call for um, more interdisciplinarity is not just because it's in vogue or that it's fundable, but rather because I think that the big questions in Brazilian studies moving forward would not only benefit from an interdisciplinary approach, but actually require it. And the same could be said about comparative and transnational approaches. So what are these big substantive areas? Again, from my corner of the universe, there's um, at least three questions, um, interrelated questions that I think will be important in the coming years. Um, I'll talk briefly about each of these. So the first question for Brazil, but also for Latin America more generally, is what's left after the left turn? So we know that the PT rose to power, um, just as other leftist governments throughout the region um, also um, rose to power in places like Bolivia and Ecuador and Venezuela. While these cases are complex, we know that the kind of left that emerged was no longer a left exclusively made out up of formal unionized labor. Instead, it was a, le a left made up of all of society's others. Los indios, informal workers, women, black people, landless people, peasants, queer people of all shades and varieties, and people at the intersection of all of those groups. So these others of Brazil and others of Latin America are not only the sort of beneficiaries of this pink tide, so to speak, or, or the um, sort of golden decade that has swept the, the region, they are partially the reason why these, um, these um, political parties came to power in the first place. So the left turn was facilitated, as you know, by this commodities boom. Um, but now that the prices of oil, the prices of soy, the prices of iron ore, among many other commodities, have plummeted, um, and the politics of backlash are in full effect, the question is, um, what's gonna happen when the left actually inevitably loses power, right? Because we know that both through, do, through sort of natural flows of politics, they're gonna be voted out, but also the kind of unnatural flows of politics that are happening in Brazil right now. So it raises many new questions. So what has the symbolic and material impact of leftist governments been? That's one question. How entrenched will these gains in social inclusion in every area from class to sexuality and gender be? And what ways have the participatory models that have been set up actually deepened democracy in these cases? More importantly, how resilient are the legal and bureaucratic institutions that have been set up? And so while things look really scary to me from my vantage point of what's going on in Brazil, there's still a lot of reason for optimism if we look at some of um, the, the institutions that have been set up in the last 15 years. But I guess ultimately this is an empirical question. So in all of this, I believe it's equally important to approach questions of deepening democracy and social inclusion with an eye to both the material and symbolic dimensions of this. We must look at changes in patterns of racial inequality, for example, at the same time that we analyze the symbolic hierarchies that have historically um, made them be reproduced, right? And so in Brazil, this is the, these ideas that link blackness to poverty, to criminality, to ugliness, and hypersexuality. And this is here where I think interdisciplinary approaches are critical. For example, the study of popular culture aside the kind of political science version of public opinion would be interesting to get a full picture of what has been changing in recent decades. The second question is, what will real sustainable development look like? As we know, Brazil is at the center of talks about sustainable development, in part because of the Amazon, the lungs of the world, but also because of how the government has actually positioned itself vis-a-vis -vis these questions, and uh, of course in the um, recent Paris talks. 
Perhaps now more than ever, we have to develop these interdisciplinary approaches to understand these politics of development in Brazil. And this is especially the case given the setbacks in indigenous rights that we often forget um, has, have been happening in Brazil in recent years, particularly um, around these kind of situations of, 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 of deforestation in the Amazon. At the center of this is the issue in Brazil and throughout Latin America is really a fundamental contradiction that um, leftist governments in particular um, have to con contend with, right? So the impulse to redistribute um, is an impulse that is sustained by a model of redistribution that is premised on a model of extractivism. And that model of extractivism is not compatible with indigenous rights. It just isn't. Um, and it's not in that, and, um, compatible with um, a lot of different versions of environmental rights either. And we know from the work of many people in this room that the idea of sustainable development, while it wraps up very nicely these inherent contradictions, it, it does not resolve them. And my hunch is that with this commodities um, bust, things are gonna be worse, right? That there's gonna be more of an impulse to extract higher if you're only getting 50 cent or 10 cent on the dollar of these commodities that you depended on so heavily. Finally, the third question is, how is inequality reproduced in Brazil? So we know that income equality has gone down, poverty has gone down, educational outcomes have gone up, and higher education has been greatly expanded. What we often miss when we tell this story of success is the fact that even with all these improvements, Brazil, Brazil still has one of the highest Gini coefficients in the world. The level of inequality in the country is embarrassing, almost as embarrassing as this country. <laughs> so even while Bolsa Familia and Fome Zero and the plethora of PT-led social reforms are unprecedented, we have to keep this in perspective. 200 reais a month um, means a lot to a Brazilian family, a lot to the families that benefited from these programs. But in the big scheme of things, this is chump change. So I don't want to minimize the gains, but I think for those of us who care about inequality in Brazil, there is much research to be done, not only on patterns of inequality, but also on how inequality is re it reproduced in Brazil. This means studying elites with the same rigor that we study the poor. Um, we need to look at institutions and labor markets at the same time that we um, could take cues from the way Pierre Bourdieu thinks about the reproduction of inequality, which is through culture, through taste, through performances, right? And so I think that um, at the center of this, um, at least if you're interested in questions of racial inequality, is studying whiteness, or what Sueli Carneiro calls branquitude. To this point, I want to tell a story of a friend, Manuel Rosado, who is a doctoral student in the sociology department at Berkeley, and who works, does really great work. He works on the waste pickers, um, recyclers movement in Colombia and Brazil. Again, a comparison. He's in the field right now, and he's in Sao Paulo, and he found himself um, infiltrating, so to speak, an anti-government protest on March 17th. And so one of the people there told him the following. Lula told people that the problem with this country are the white people with blue eyes. She said, pointing towards her own blue eyes. Lula turned everything into us versus them, blacks against whites, poor against rich, nor the chinos against Palestinos, 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 I was thinking. These conflicts never existed in our country before. So this is the kind of story that I would never have access to. <laughs> Manuel, while horrified by these words, has blue eyes and was able to blend in in a way that I never could. Yet Brazilian studies in the United States, at least contemporary studies, typically don't tell the stories. We're not interested in that. We're not interested in hanging out with the anti-government protesters. And I think that in order to understand inequality in Brazil, though, we actually do need to do that. We need to interview the poor black and brown youth who flooded Chiqui shoppings um, in 2013 and 2014 in those holezinhos, at the same time that we need to talk to the white elites who felt attacked by the very presence of these young people. For every ethnography of Hacinha, there should be an ethnography of Gavia or of Leblon. 
Before I end, I would like to say something about the institutional side of this. So I don't think that any of what I laid out here would be possible without the kinds of continual exchanges and collaborations that many of us have with scholars in Brazil. But collaborations that are, be, are gonna become increasingly difficult. Um, one of my friends, Amilcar, when I was like, what happened to copies? He's like, copy sumiu, like there's just no more money, right? And so it's a difficult situation. So what this means, I think, for Brazilian studies is that your points, Marshall, earlier are, are even more critical, that we might have to pick up some of the slack if we really care about these kinds of exchanges and collaborations. And I also believe that we have to put our money where our mouths are in one other way. As we continue to foster the kinds of collaborations and um, exchanges with Brazilian scholars, the kinds that so enrich our work, we must also open up spaces like the Tinker, like other visiting programs, um, to more transparency and open them to a wider range of scholars. Um, with all of the social policies that we've been talking about over the last couple of days, um, it's very clear that the face of academia in Brazil is slowly but surely changing in terms of race, in terms of class, in terms of the substantive topics that these young people care about. What that means for Brazilian studies in the US is that we can no longer talk about race and class inequalities in our work, but reproduce those very racial and class hierarchies in our institutions and in our exchanges. So Brazilian studies in the US must reflect the demographics of the two societies we straddle, Brazil and the US. And I should say that I should give a shout out to UT Austin, who has done so much in terms of actually um, producing young Afro-Brazilian PhDs through the dedicated work of a lot of scholars there, but namely Joan Vargas, um, Charlie Hill, Juliet Hooker, and Kristen Smith. And this is also why seeing Marcelo Paixão yesterday present his beautiful, brilliant, and profoundly personal piece really nearly brought tears to my eyes. As an African American from Flint, Michigan, the first to graduate um, high school in my family, and as somebody who actually studies race um, and anti-racism, I was really honored that he was part of this panel and I'm really honored to be a part of it. So thank you so much, Valeo. Nossa terceira eh, eh, palestrante, conferencista, é Pedro Meira Monteiro, que é professor e chefe do Departamento de Espanhol e Português da Princeton University. Ele editou ou é co-autor de vários livros, entre eles, Mário de Andrade e Sérgio Boaco de Holanda, Correspondências, eh, The First Class, Transits of Brazilian Literature Abroad, Signo e Desterro, Sérgio Buarque de Holanda e Imaginação do Brasil, e é, Futuro Abolido, Machado de Assis e o Memorial de Ares. É, bom, Pedro. Obrigado, Jim. Obrigado a todos. É, começo agradecendo a... Comitê Executivo da Brasa, pelo convite, é uma honra, uma alegria estar aqui. Uh, a todos que estão trabalhando, né, Ramon e todos os outros meninos e meninas que estão por aí fazendo com que isso aconteça. E muito especialmente ao Jim pelo convite e por ser o artífice desse encontro. É, eu não, não resisti a dar um título ao, a essa apresentação, a essa comunicação, Uh, e o título é A Emergência do Brasil, Nenhum Golpe de Dados Abolirá o Azar. Uh, a existência do futuro é um tema controverso no plano político, mas é também uma questão teórica espinhosa. Não há futuro sem memória, ou seja, não se imagina o futuro sem uma espécie de acerto de contas com o passado, ou com aquilo que somos capazes de perceber e reconstruir como passado. É muito difícil, nestes nossos tempos de republicanismo em crise no Brasil, resistir a politizar a pergunta sobre o futuro do país e, consequentemente, a pergunta sobre o futuro dos estados dos estudos brasileiros fora do Brasil. 
O súbito aumento de interesse pelo Brasil e pela língua portuguesa, que chegou a índices muito altos há apenas alguns anos, vem sofrendo um baque, como sabemos e sentimos na pele todos os que ensinamos fora do Brasil. Mas quando a fantasia do Brasil poderoso ameaça se desfazer, somos convidados a ponderar o que se ganhou e o que se perdeu. Tentando ver pelo lado positivo, acredito que o refluxo de interesse pelo Brasil, que acompanha a crise econômica e política contemporânea, possa servir para a compreensão de um quadro em que os estudos brasileiros e o estudo da língua portuguesa se reafirmem numa dupla precariedade. Por um lado, todos somos obrigados a abandonar o barco da fantasia nacional, isto é, aquele no qual subíamos há apenas três ou quatro anos, com a promessa de que seríamos levados ao mundo desenvolvido, com o Brasil se destacando como parceiro privilegiado no grupo dos BRICS, ou, segundo as fantasias mais frondosas, com o Brasil se fazendo resposta literal à provocação de Stefan Zweig. O, o país do futuro teria finalmente levantado sua âncora e partir agora para um lugar faustoso. Por outro lado, o futuro que não se realizou e a desconfiança diante desse barco cheio de promessas obriga a repensar a própria fantasia de um arranque histórico. Tal fantasia supõe que as manchas do passado colonial e escravista de todo um país pudessem ser simplesmente, simplesmente varridas após uma década de desenvolvimento econômico e de reorganização do quadro social, com a emergência de sujeitos políticos que ainda hoje tentamos nomear sempre precariamente. Classe C, ralé, batalhadores, emergentes, etc. Não tenho competência para entrar no debate econômico ou mesmo sociológico sobre essa emergência de um novo Brasil. Eu deixo aqui de propósito a palavra emergência com sua dupla significação. Mas talvez, do ponto de vista de um estudioso da literatura, seja possível pensar numa agenda urgente, a qual, na esteira dos estudos de Heloísa Buarque de Holanda e tantos outros, se codifica naquilo que João Camilo Pena recentemente chamou de modos da margem, ou aquilo que Mário Augusto Medeiros, pensando na literatura negra e periférica no Brasil, chamou de a descoberta do insólito. Em ambos os casos, está se falando do país que surgiu daquilo que, a falta de melhor expressão, chama-se de uma era Lula. Sem entrar no mérito da presença de Lula como mediador de forças sociais ou como galvanizador de potências latentes, o fato é que o início desta década nos entregou, aos que estudamos o Brasil, um país em sua plena, plena emergência. Hoje sabemos que a emergência seria seguida por uma queda imediata e vertiginosa. Mas queda de quê? E queda aonde? De onde se caiu e onde estamos? Sem responder a essa dupla pergunta, não me parece que estaremos à altura de falar sobre o futuro dos estudos brasileiros fora do Brasil. Uma resposta que se baseia unicamente na montanha russa da economia global e no grande e viciado cassino que é o capitalismo contemporâneo não vai nos levar muito longe. Da mesma forma, quero crer que uma resposta que busque a compreensão da corrupção como um fenômeno momentâneo restrito a este ou aquele governo ou partido, não vai sair do círculo vicioso do elogio da virtude imaculada, que sempre pareceu tão distante aos olhos dos europeus que visitavam os trópicos. Não devemos esquecer que a de um viajante batavo, no século XVII, a máxima segundo a qual, ao sul do equinócio, não haveria pecado possível, o que posteriormente se tornaria alegoria no frevo de Chico Buarque, ou viraria farsa poético-filosófica no catatal de Paulo Leminski. Ambos comentários de uma terra pouco afeita aos limites internos impostos à ação, pouco dada, portanto, aos freios que a consciência protestante costuma opor ao pecado. Nossa liberdade tropical é nosso grande pecado, este o fantasma que o humanismo renascentista de Barlois jogou sobre nós. A questão fundamental, a um só tempo poética e política, colocada pela chamada literatura marginal, será talvez aquilo que João Camilo Pena chamou, 
pensando na literatura contemporânea em seu apelo irresistível ao real, de uma necessária, e eu cito, nova ontologia, não mais ligada à faculdade clássica kantiana de produção da imagem e da imaginação. Fim de citação. Não sendo este o momento para uma discussão teórica mais detida, apenas retenho aquilo que me parece urgente e gritante nessa proposta. Os textos da, da literatura marginal resistem a ser classificados como objetos autônomos de arte, ou seja, é toda uma concepção da estética que se põe em questão, trazendo a história e as condições sociais para o centro do debate da produção cultural, como se agora não fosse mais apenas o artista que devesse subir o morro, como fez Oiticica nos anos 70, mas o próprio crítico e scholar de literatura é chamado a ver o que está acontecendo nas comunidades, nas periferias, nas margens, nas prisões, etc. Penso aqui nas observações de Leila Lenin sobre Capão Pecado, de Ferrez. Os paratextos que compõem as várias edições do livro recolocam a questão do testemunho, aliás, central para a discussão da memória nas sociedades pós-ditatoriais, em um plano iniludivelmente coletivo. Eu cito, A polyphonic forum that is reflective of the diversity of the community and social engagement of many of its members, especially of the ones involved in its artistic milieu. End of quote. A noção de polifonia, aqui pensada sob a égide dos subaltern studies, e, portanto, sob o marco de uma leitura de Gramsci, que foi fundamental para a concepção de um novo sujeito político durante a redemocratização brasileira, essa noção de polifonia evoca os limites de uma concepção autônoma da obra de arte, mas evoca também os limites de uma ideia autônoma do próprio sujeito. Voltando à discussão de João Camilo Pena, trata-se do testemunho como parte de uma política identitária agonística, ou seja, a compreensão do fenômeno social nesse Brasil que emerge e afunda precisa de uma nova, nova ontologia, que pergunte pelo ser do sujeito emergente, não como quem busca sua verdade escondida, que a literatura viria a revelar. Trata-se de uma noção radical de literatura como produção de novos territórios do saber, de quebradas que levam a uma profundidade não mais isolada no espaço e no tempo, como se o que houvesse fosse uma sociedade arcaica e profunda prestes a desaparecer. A favela ou a comunidade, o baile funk, as novas mídias, os espaços em que raça e gênero se redefinem, ao mesmo, são, ao, são ao mesmo tempo isolados e interconectados. A própria voz do escritor ou do produtor cultural talvez seja indelevelmente invadida pelo coletivo. São, portanto, identidades que agonizam, não apenas porque os sujeitos sofrem, mas porque a noção de sujeito vai se alterando, e vai se alterando à medida em que se altera a composição do corpo social. As políticas sociais básicas da última década, se correto André Singer, mesmo nos seus mais sombrios momentos de crítica ao atual governo federal, são uma conquista já incorporada à agenda política brasileira, da esquerda à direita. E acho que a Ângela Paiva falou um pouco disso ontem aqui. É um ganho sem volta, digamos assim. No entanto, a grande questão, ainda mais gritante que a corrupção ou que a escandalosa confusão entre público e privado, que invade a cena política brasileira desde sempre, a grande questão talvez seja o que fazer de uma promessa não cumprida de inclusão, que a crise do crédito e a taxa de desemprego sinalizam e que oferece de bandeja aos que queiram entender a emergência do Brasil um problema imenso. Retornando a Singer, lembro que, em suas análises mais recentes da crise do lulupetismo, anteriores ainda ao acirramento da crise política com a Lava Jato e o aumento escandaloso do círculo dos suspeitos, o ex-porta-voz de Lula falava na perda de um horizonte utópico com a quebra daquilo que ele chamava de um pacto Rooseveltiano, que apenas se esboçara timidamente na década anterior. A referência óbvia é o New Deal e a formação de uma imensa sociedade de consumo. Digamos que esse é o passo não dado, apenas esboçado, que ficou no ar. 
O custo desse retrocesso, ou dessa falha no avanço rumo a um futuro mais inclusivo, é o que está diante dos nossos olhos. Creio que todos, tanto os que nos alinhamos na crítica à flagrante perda de institucionalidade na busca midiática da justiça, quanto aqueles que legitimamente veem a insustentabilidade política do atual governo federal, todos têm diante de si um país que emerge de um experimento falhado de inclusão. A Constituição Cidadã, de 1988, foi implantada num cenário político fissurado e entrou, ainda assim, marcando território na chamada década perdida. Os ganhos no terreno da saúde pública, por exemplo, são inegáveis nos últimos 20 anos no Brasil. E uma das pautas aparentemente explícitas, até onde se pode achar algo explícito nos dias de hoje, da, a, da agenda do PMDB, de um eventual governo Temer, é justamente, se vocês analisarem, o desmantelamento do SUS. A educação é uma carta ainda bastante fora do baralho, uma promessa nunca ensaiada a sério. E os direitos individuais, constitucionalmente garantidos, formaram o leito em que floresceram alguns dos experimentos mais radicais e inovadores no Brasil, ligados a uma política de gênero e aquilo que, se voltássemos uns 30 ou 40 anos na história, chamaríamos ainda, porventura, de uma política do desejo. Agora, esse mesmo quadro se encontra em perigo, seja com o aprofundamento de um moralismo de base evangélica ou simplesmente laica, seja com o recrudescimento de preconceitos apenas momentaneamente reprimidos. Que se pense, um par de exemplos grotescos, na figura de um Jair Bolsonaro como herói da moralização, ou nesse verdadeiro topos das redes sociais, que são os selfies tirados com a polícia em meio às manifestações pró-impeachment. Ao mesmo tempo, esse país emergente, cujo fôlego é hoje uma incógnita, é inconcebível sem o arranque econômico que, bem feitas as contas, arranhou muitos dos princípios garantidos pela Constituição de 1988. Que se pense nos direitos indígenas e na questão ecológica, diante de um desenvolvimentismo que parece reacender os fantasmas do avanço civilizatório a qualquer custo. Quantos Bye Bye Brasil ou quantos Iracema, uma transa amazônica, o cinema nacional está nos devendo? De uma forma ou outra, a emergência de novos sujeitos políticos, alguns deles mergulhados na descrença diante do sistema político que, paradoxalmente, lhes possibilitou ocupar a cena cultural, essa é a emergência dos novos sujeitos políticos, o fato social total, o enigma que, se não me engano, pode e deve marcar os estudos sobre o Brasil nos próximos anos ou talvez na próxima década. Tal questão, que é radicalmente política, mistura-se a outra, que é de uma política menos localizada, mas não menos importante, a política linguística, que talvez possamos compreender a partir da discussão sobre a internacionalização do currículo universitário nos Estados Unidos. Quando cheguei a este país, há quase 15 anos, Logo me inteirei, através de colegas norte-americanos e brasileiros, do espaço periférico que o português ocupava e ainda ocupa em departamentos de línguas uh, e literaturas estrangeiras. Não há dúvida de que, no plano da administração dos programas de língua portuguesa, com poucas exceções, nós existimos à sombra do espanhol. Isso não é necessariamente ruim, e, aliás, o aprendizado acelerado da língua, com os cursos de português especialmente desenhados para hispanofalantes, significa, quando pensado em contraste com o aprendizado de outras línguas, a entrada muito mais rápida no universo da cultura e da literatura, ou da história e das ciências sociais. Em suma, na geopolítica das línguas na Universidade Norte-Americana, nós pegamos carona no espanhol. No entanto, essa carona é benéfica, porque ela abre uma senda rápida do ponto de vista da aquisição linguística, ao mesmo tempo em que abre um universo comparativo muito rico para os estudantes. Trata-se do mundo ibérico, do universo latino-americano, ou ainda do que possa ter restado do avanço colonial das potências ibéricas desde os primeiros impulsos da globalização no século XV. Não é pouco o que se abre às vistas do estudante com a língua portuguesa aprendida ao lado do espanhol. 
No crescente interesse pela internacionalização do currículo universitário nos Estados Unidos, aos que teimam em ver o laivo imperialista de um mal contido desejo de domínio do globo. Os menos persecutórios talvez vejam aí uma oportunidade interessante, afinal, se discute a aquisição da língua estrangeira como instrumento de compreensão da diversidade cultural, num mundo cujas fronteiras se fazem cada vez mais porosas para alguns e cada vez mais sólidas e intransponíveis para outros. Entre o acadêmico e o refugiado existe um fosso, um abismo a sinalizar que o desterro é a condição existencial de ambos, embora o acadêmico possa viver o deslocamento como experiência de desnaturalização do seu objeto, enquanto o refugiado segue sendo o condenado da terra, nos termos ainda tão atuais de Fanon. Mas que instrumento é esse que supostamente permite cruzar fronteiras e misturar-se ao outro? No plano da internacionalização, quero crer que a definição dos requisitos mínimos de aquisição de uma língua estrangeira seja um grande desafio. Eu ainda me surpreendo ao perceber que, não poucas vezes, o aprendizado da língua é entendido como a aquisição de um instrumento neutro como se, ao aprender uma língua estrangeira, dominássemos um código afastado do próprio sujeito, como se o aprendizado da língua não contivesse, em si mesmo, a possibilidade de uma conversão a outra cultura, a outros sujeitos, a outros códigos complexos que operam no interior da própria língua. E aí a importância da literatura marginal. Os que ensinam literatura fora do Brasil e que se veem, ao mesmo tempo, como professores de língua, certamente entenderão o que quero dizer. Já aqueles que, orgulhosa e higienicamente, dizem que não ensinam língua e que só ensinam literatura, estes dificilmente poderão entrar no debate sobre a língua como instrumento político na formação internacional que todos almejamos para os nossos alunos. Em suma, Concluo sugerindo que a compreensão da língua como algo afastado dos chamados cursos de conteúdo, os cursos avançados de literatura, história, etc., é uma forma de reforçar aqueles muros que separam o intelectual de algo de que ele quer desesperadamente falar. Como se a cidade letrada fosse ainda uma fortaleza inexpugnável, na qual se mantém presos os sonhos de uma literatura ou de uma cultura separada do mundo. Mundo este, no qual a voz dos sujeitos é cada vez mais um problema coletivo e onde o acadêmico é uma peça talvez tão importante quanto deslocada e desajeitada. Obrigado. É, Tony Pereira está no, no, no auditório. Se ele está aqui, por favor, dirige-se à, à mesa. Eu não estou vendo ele. Ele está aqui? Bom, é, nós temos 20 minutos para fazer o que, que foi chamado Town Hall. É, a partir das 4 horas, podemos conversar sobre a situação política atual, se alguém quiser falar sobre isso. Mas eu peço que esse debate agora, de 20 minutos, seja sobre o futuro de estudos brasileiros, no sentido que as colaborações, as intervenções, nos ajuda a pensar um plano estratégico para o trabalho da Brasa. Então, se, se vocês quiserem fazer intervenções, nos ajuda muito que vocês pensem conosco sobre como podemos fortalecer os estudos brasileiros nos Estados Unidos e outras partes do mundo e qual seria o papel da Brasa nesse sentido. E eu aceito sugestões loucas que nós vamos cumprir, cumprir, poder cumprir, porque eu acho que é o momento de voar um pouco, brainstorm e pensar grande nesse momento é, atual. Então, tem dois microfones a, abertos. Se quiser falar, só dirige-se ao microfone para começar esse debate de 20 minutos. E Brian vai tomar a, anotações sobre essa, essa conversa e a gente vai div, divulgar isso depois do Congresso. Então, está aberto a intervenção. É, eu queria aproveitar... Identifique seu nome e de ah, onde desculpa. você é. Eu, eu sou o João, eu sou uh, lecturer de português em, em Colômbia e fiz doutorado uh, na CUNY. E eu queria justamente falar sobre o futuro e pensar um pouco no que o Pedro falou. E também, uh, quando, quando o senhor menciona o número de brasilianistas, que são 500, se esse número inclui tantos os lectures, perceptors, todos esses pesquisadores de língua e também de ensino e pedagogia no, 
nos Estados Unidos, e como inserir todo esse grupo que faz muita pesquisa, porque se a gente olhar no programa da Brasa, hoje tem uma mesa sobre pedagogia. Então, como trazer todo esse, esse grupo grande de pesquisadores, como o Pedro falou no final, que é o início, onde a gente, os alunos começam a estudar português nos cursos básicos e que tem sempre essa relação, esse preconceito com o básico, não quero ensinar português ou, ou outra língua. E eu acho que a gente precisa pensar em maneiras de trazer esse grande número de pesquisadores e incluir nessa lista de brasileiros também, porque o ensino de língua e pedagogia também faz parte dessa pesquisa. Para a gente pensar um pouco sobre isso. Está aberto. Um, my name is James Ito Adler, and with Bjorn Maber Lewis, we founded the Cambridge Institute for Brazilian Studies. A little tiny ONGI in Harvard Square, where two aposentados are able to be free from many of the pressures of the university, without money, of course, uh, <laughs> to carry on our program. And we present it this morning, and I just want to bring some good news and some not so good news and some really bad news. Um, if you read the MLA surveys on Portuguese language enrollments, uh, the last study that came out between 2009 and 2013, Portuguese was one of only four languages that resisted the overall drop in foreign language study, which was approximately 7%. And Portuguese rose 10%. Yay. That's good news. Um, Unfortunately, the MLA only does these surveys when they have enough money, back to Marshall Aiken's point, um, and they didn't do a survey in 2015. So I wrote to every Romance language department in New England that had a tradition of teaching Portuguese. That was 30 out of 233 accredited institutions of higher education in New England. And the data from the 17 departments, and James Brown was not one of them, that responded with their 2015 fall enrollments, the drop-off between 2013 and 2015 is on the order of 12%. We're growing at Brown, unfortunately. I'm sorry we didn't send well, the report. Well, you, you could have helped my you data, skewed the statistics. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but programs like Yale, Harvard, um, ha have suffered serious drop-offs. And we're trying to figure out in the research, I'd love to pass this on to somebody who actually studies Portuguese. I'm an anthropologist. I, I don't do pure language studies. But we really de do need to focus empirical research, following on Envisioning Brazil, which I think is one of the great books of the last couple of decades. And that needs to be updated and pushed forward. And there's only one group that can do it. Thank you. Raza. If I could add to this, the stroke all you guys who teach Portuguese, without Portuguese, there is no Brazilian studies in the United States. So you guys are the most important part. Uh, the MLA survey. Could you identify yourself, please? Uh, Luis, I'm, uh, my name is Luiz Valente. I'm a, a professor of Portuguese and Brazilian studies and comparative literature here at Brown and uh, a very proud founding member of Braza. Uh, the MLA uh, language survey is done every five years. It's impossible to do it every year. So uh, it's done regularly every five years. I just wanted to make this correction, okay? There should be no expectation that the MLA will do a language survey every year. It's impossible. So let's not have a parallel debate. The next person, please. Uh, my name is Mark Lokensgaard. I'm the chair of the Languages Department at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, which is a small Catholic liberal arts uh, university and is a Hispanic-serving institution. And I just wanted to emphasize uh, Pedro's point about um, the relationship between Spanish and Portuguese. I think that for many institutions, especially Hispanic-serving institutions, but as we know in the United States, Hispanics are in many regions of the country where they have not traditionally been before, and we're gonna see a population coming through um, our institutions of higher education. I think that one of our strategies really needs to be to emphasize, uh, we found it very important to emphasize for heritage speakers of Spanish to take courses, advanced courses in Spanish, people who are already conversant in Spanish, but maybe 
field, not so secure about the reading and writing ability to take those kind of courses to really uh, firm up their knowledge, but also to take Portuguese as a way of uh, capitalizing on the knowledge they already have. And we found that this really is very uh, deeply meaningful to our heritage speakers of Spanish to do both of those things. And I think this is a strategy that we need to pursue um, you know, not just at Hispanic serving institutions, but I'd like to see maybe if Braza could help with uh, uh, perhaps putting some uh, pressure on HACU, uh, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities in the United States, to pay some attention to this issue also, then I think more of that growth um, that we could see outside of sort of the big centers might begin to happen even more. Thank you. Boa tarde. Meu nome é Flávia, eu sou doutoranda pela FGV e agora eu estou na CUNY fazendo Bolsa Sanduíche. E uma coisa que talvez pudesse ser interessante seria pensar as conexões entre a Brasa e, as e algumas universidades brasileiras, conexões até diretas, porque a gente, pelo menos espero que continue essa crise, a gente não sabe o que, que vai dar, mas é fato que já tem um tempo que existem muitas 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 possibilidades de brasileiros virem aqui e estarem contribuindo para esse debate desde dessa conexão entre o Brasil e os Estados Unidos e só que a gente tem uma série de, de problemas para isso porque tem a gente tem pessoas que vieram de famílias trabalhadoras e tem um, uma grande dificuldade de lidar com o inglês né Então, eu acho que talvez a Brasa pudesse contribuir uh, diretamente com as faculdades para fazer com que esses estudantes não cheguem aqui, eu acho que até certo ponto, no meu caso também, com tantas dificuldades com o inglês. Então, eu, é muito interessante, aqui todo mundo fala um português incrível, na CUNY, na Colômbia, eu tenho lidado com pessoas com português maravilhoso, mas eu acho que essa talvez essa mão dupla fosse interessante, se essa é a minha, minha, minha sugestão, que talvez a Brasa pudesse se conectar. Obrigado. Mais uma intervenção? Sim, por favor. Pode ficar na fila também, não tem problema, para a gente economizar tempo. É, boa tarde, eu sou Ana Flávia, pós-doutoranda em História pela Unicamp. Ah, tendo em vista questões levantadas pela mesa, eu fiquei extremamente interessada na possibilidade de a Brasa estabelecer uma interlocução com outros perfis de intelectuais brasileiros. Nesse momento de crise que a gente vive, em que as, as, os diferentes sujeitos políticos que produzem é, pensamentos sobre a experiência brasileira estão se expressando, eu acho que é um momento para a gente recolocar o, lo, o, o local da academia e como a academia também tem dialogado com todos esses processos e tendo em vista que o próximo encontro acontecerá no Brasil, é uma oportunidade de então fazer um convite e garantir a presença desses, dessa outra, dessas outras intelectualidades que estão produzindo a respeito do Brasil. Né? Você tem sujeitos nos movimentos sociais mais diversos, LGBT, negro, movimento de mulheres, movimento do, a, a, de pessoas do campo, juventude. Essas pessoas têm tido, têm, têm, têm tido coisas a dizer, e a gente, mais do que nunca, a gente precisa... A, a, fortalecer a nossa capacidade, desenvolver a nossa capacidade de, de, de interlocução com esses sujeitos. Tá, obrigado. Hi, my name is Kara Snyder, and I'm in the Women's Studies Department at the University of Maryland. And I just have a question, actually, for Dr. Pacel. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Pacel. Pacel. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for your, your talk. Um, I thought you brought up a really a lot of interesting points, and I actually wanted to ask you for some of your suggestions on how to make how to incorporate some of these practices of deep interdisciplinarity, incorporate more issues of race and diaspora into Brasa. If you had some suggestions that you would like to share. Thanks. Yeah. Do you want to respond? Yeah. Oh, to that question. Yeah, if you want to, I mean. Yeah. yeah. So I, I actually think that, um, and this is where being um, a newer scholar in this, you know, it's like history repeats itself. There's nothing new under the sun. But I think the starting point is to, kind of enter the interdisciplinary conversation at earlier stages of research, right? Um, so not, so that we don't have just an additive 
additive kind of um, model where it's like, oh, you're doing that, I'm doing this too, let's do something together, but rather start to ask questions together, right? And to think about what it would look like if we answered those questions together, right? I think that that is one of um, the ways to think about it. And one of the opportunities I think we have um, is really unlikely pairings, right? So um, I was talking um, to the head of IPEA, I was talking to Rafael Osorio, and I was asking him a question about some data. And he was like, we just have too much data to actually analyze, which is absolutely right. IPEA has too much data to analyze. And like, there are many questions that that data could actually answer. And so for me, it would be really interesting to kind of come up with a set of questions like the questions that I have in my mind about the reproduction of inequality um, in a space where people are doing those kind of demographic, um, working with the, the pop, right, at the same time that they're looking at what this looks like in the everyday, but thinking about how to answer the questions together. So I don't know what that looks like in terms of Braza, but like some concerted space to kind of like actually build a, a collective research project would be really interesting. Boa tarde, meu nome é Erisvaldo, eu sou professor da Universidade Federal de Ouro Preto. Além de professor, eu sou pai de santo, Babalorixá. É, a próxima Brasa vai acontecer no Rio de Janeiro e uma das questões que nos tem incomodado hoje do ponto de vista é, da educação não é bem um moralismo religioso evangélico, mas neopentecostal. É, o neopentecostalismo avança no Brasil e interfere em diversos campos da vida social brasileira hoje. E o campo da educação tem sido o mais afetado, inclusive agora, na discussão do Plano Nacional de Educação, onde as câmaras de vereadores da maioria dos municípios brasileiros é, votaram contra a inserção da discussão de gênero e sexualidade dentro da escola, caracterizando essa inserção de é, ideologia de gênero. É, a minha pergunta e o meu incômodo é como os intelectuais da Brasa, sobretudo os americanos, é, poderiam contribuir com uma discussão sobre esses efeitos do neopentecostalismo, que durante muito tempo nós interpretávamos como sendo é uma importação americana e hoje o Brasil já exporta para o mundo todo, não só exporta, mas estabelece um modo de vida e vai interferindo nas nossas escolas, na formação acadêmica e criando não um moralismo evangélico, mas neopentecostal. Obrigado. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bjorn Mabry Lewis, co-founder with James Ito Adler at the Cambridge Institute for Brazilian Studies, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, one of the reasons we founded the Cambridge Institute for Brazilian Studies was we felt uh, uncomfortable in many circles in the Boston area, which is a center of academic learning, one of the important ones, uh, uncomfortable with the lack of knowledge about Brazil that we saw all around us. Few people spoke Portuguese, few people knew about Brazil, few people, people didn't go there, even within the academy. So one of the things we did, and I've been a long-term member of the Brazil Network, Braza, uh, former executive committee member, uh, Rubens uh, Barbosa, the ambassador to Brazil, called on all leaders of Latin American Studies programs, Brazilian Studies program in 1999, uh, feeling the same feeling that I'm conveying today. Uh, uh, Brown and Braza, James Green, convoked another meeting in 2005. Uh, President Fernando Henrique Cardoso was there, uh, Marshall Lake and many of you were there. Same feeling in 2005, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and always the call to do some research. So, but the research never got off the ground, uh, except for uh, Marshall and colleagues' marvelous book. So we undertook some research in New England. I wrote a paper about it, brought it, presented it this morning. Uh, on the 233 institutions in Massachusetts, uh, not in Massachusetts, in New England, as a representative example of how New England studies proceed, uh, worked on, who's doing what, where, and how. Over 75% of the schools in New England, accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, have no Brazilian studies whatsoever. Of the remaining 24%, uh, uh, about 9% are, are, are state of the art. And I would, of course, consider Brown University probably the best 
in the United States, uh, in Brazilian studies, certainly in New England. Pagamos de uh, 100 so, dólares so, para dizer isso. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, James. So here's 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 my suggestion. Instead of simply saying the same things that we've been saying since 1999, I think no better institution than Braza, as we at the Cambridge Institute could certainly help, but other institutions could as well. No better institution than Braza to establish to I move to establish a task force to do something about the state of Brazilian studies in the United States. Uh, if, if anyone cares to read my paper, I have eight suggestions on what might be done. I'm not going to go into them here. I've already spoken too long. But a task force at Braza, thinking about it, uh, raising money. I think Marshall was right on, on, on point, as he uh, normally is. F raising money, uh, particularly for tenure slots and for institutes in which tenure slotted professors can exercise their vision for Brazilian studies. Uh, seems to me uh, is necessary, long overdue, otherwise uh, vai sempre ficar na lanterninha, uh, Brazilian studies, e eu não gostaria de ver isso. Muito obrigado. Tá, obrigado. Bom, é, terminou a sessão é, da... No. Too late? <laughs> Quick. One minute. Quick one. One minute. Okay. Eu sou ferro. Caxiz, né? I just wanted to say uh, I appreciate... Uh, Could you identify yourself, please? Yeah, sorry. Robert Moser from the University of Georgia. Um, so I wanted to, I appreciate Marshall's uh, comments about uh, STEM, STEM areas being the uh, trend going forward. Um, I just wanted to kind of reaffirm, and I know you did this as well in your talk, just the how fundamental it is that, uh, that the humanities students also find their place in this vision going forward. Um, you know, sadly, my experience, even in just the last uh, 15 years, at UGA is that um, even humanities students are becoming increasingly le uh, less interested in literature. And I'm just wondering uh, if you have any suggestions about how to continue to make um, language study uh, relevant for students in the humanities. And I'm thinking of you know, experiential learning uh, tactics, uh, finding internships and research projects, not just for forestry and uh, you know, public health students, but also for literature students and language students. Thank you, Robert. Um, you have 30 seconds to answer. 30 seconds. I would say what we're fighting is a bigger trend far beyond Brazilian studies in the United States, and that is the collapse of the humanities. And to the largest extent, this has to do with, I'm at a liberal arts college within a major research university. Yet the students who come in, Whatever they think they're going to do, they're all professionally oriented. So the way to convince them is to convince them there's some kind of value in knowing a foreign language, whether they're going to do history, anthropology, medicine, whatever it is, because we're facing this across all the departments, right? Their parents tell them this, everybody around them says, you have to prepare yourself for the job market. And so even though they come in saying, I want to be in a liberal arts college, their orientation is completely professional. So this is much bigger than Brazilian studies. It's a problem for the humanities in general, and I don't have any solutions for that. Bom, eu quero agradecer a, a mesa por uma excelente intervenção. Nós vamos propor aos conferencistas e às pessoas de ontem, talvez uh, preparar uma versão para ser publicada no site da Brasa. Eu acho que seria muito interessante para divulgar essas ideias para as pessoas de além uh, das pessoas que estão no auditório. Que é um grande aplauso para todo mundo, por favor.